Okay, good um, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to the second panel event in our series of uh, people in property uh, events. Uh, we've got nine panelists for you this evening, uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, how to get started uh, in real estate. We've got a, a great cross section of uh, graduates, um, many of whom I've had the pleasure of teaching over the years. Uh, and uh, we've also got um, some uh, employer representatives who are going to be talking to us uh, as well. So you're all very welcome. Uh, we are recording this session uh, as advertised, um, and we do have the intention eventually of putting uh, those recordings up for um, public, uh, public view, and we'll send around details of that uh, in, in due course. So um, for those of you who, who don't or, or, or haven't for a while um, looked, looked at what Sheffield Hallam is up to on the real estate front, um, we uh, have for many decades now, 40 decades, no, 40 years, not 40 decades, uh, run um, undergraduate real estate um, courses uh, back in the day, uh, urban land economics, uh, as may be known to some of you, uh, more recently restyled uh, BSC real estate. Uh, we have a conversion master's equivalent as well. And as you can see there on the slide, we have some um, uh, more uh, novel uh, and of the moment um, products coming online too, in terms of degree apprentices and also courses targeting uh, an international audience of students. Um, so we're very pleased to have this opportunity to um, access our, you know, really, really extensive alumni and contacts, uh, employer contacts um, network in order to bring you this and the other events uh, in our series. As you can see on the slides, um, we have two um, sub panels. Uh, the first sub panel is going to be chaired by me uh, and will be broadly focused or broadly comprised of um, the, the, the graduate perspective, um, looking at the entry into the work market in real estate and some of the sort of uh, good fortune that then has flown out for, uh, for our students um, uh, in follow on years. Um, and then for the second panel, which my colleague um, uh, uh, Nikki Power is going to chair, uh, we've got the employer, the recruiter perspective um, to balance things up and, and, and see what um, our panelists have to say from that. The format for the two uh, panels will be that each uh, panelist is going to introduce themselves. They've got a five minute um, platform, as it were, to um, sell out their stall, both in terms of who they are and what their background is. And I've also given them uh, what I've called a perspective, which is a particular angle to come at um, their five minutes um, from. So hopefully we'll get a nice cross section of issues emerging through uh, the five minute presentations. We've then got um, time set aside for some Q&A, uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, per session. Um, and we will be finishing at um, half, past, uh, half past the hour. So I'm gonna stop uh, my sharing now and uh, invite um, Holly, no pressure. Holly, you're going to kick us off. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Just check in. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I got thumbs up. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Holly McClellan. Um, I'm a graduate um, at Knife Frank in the Manchester office. Um, I graduated from Hallam in 2020. So um, kind of we all got sent home in March and then finished with my degree at home, which was um, interesting. Um, and luckily had secured a job before all the kind of coronavirus stuff kicked off. So I was very lucky um, and my job stayed and it was pushed back till September, but um, I've managed to start my job kind of in the office to start with and now kind of working from home. Um, but I feel quite fortunate that it's gone pretty smoothly despite the sort of weird year that we've all had. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk through kind of some of the tips that I picked up um, kind of through the process of applying just for jobs and stuff um, in final year um, because I know it can be quite tricky kind of managing quite a heavy workload um, whilst kind of applying for jobs or kind of deciding what you want to do next um, so um, kind of towards the start of final year I sent out loads of applications um, to a lot of the bigger firms and things like that um, I sent out lots of emails to people I knew. Um, I know Katie's going to talk about um, the importance of like keeping connected to people in the property industry, but that is something that um, really helped me um, in final year, kind of contacting people that I'd met on placement year or that I'd met through kind of doing work experience and things like that, um, and basically just emailing them and asking if maybe they had an opportunity or anything like that. Um, 
And I think something that I kind of got over was the kind of embarrassment or maybe awkwardness of just sending someone a blank email being like, just kind of just suggesting, oh, I wonder if you've got any opportunities coming up or anything like that. I think that's something definitely to kind of um, not to be worried about if you have a connection and you've met someone before, or even if you've not met them before, but you like the look of maybe what they do or where they work or um, the kind of company and what kind of what projects they're working on. I don't think there's um, anything to be afraid of in kind of just sending out, sending out an email um, and asking maybe for an opportunity or something like that. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I'd suggest maybe definitely don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, I did a placement year um, at Savile's down in London and I was very, very set on getting a job there and it didn't work out. And I was quite fortunate the fact that I'd sent out a lot of other applications that I could rely on. Um, and in the end, I'm probably happier doing what I'm doing now to what I kind of had perceived myself to be doing then. Um, and I would also say um, it's quite competitive um, kind of when you're applying to a lot of those kind of bigger companies um, and there's kind of I kind of found that there's lots of different people who kind of find out find out about real estate um, in maybe whilst at university so they go through the non-cognate route um, and so there's when I came to applying for things, there were loads of different people um, applying to jobs. And when I got to interviews, I was maybe one of the only people that had done an undergrad real estate degree. Um, so I think definitely like use that to work in your favor. I think um, we like, you know, you've got a load of experience that a lot of other people don't have. Um, and that can really um, kind of work well for you. Um, and, um, but also something that I kind of found was maybe um, don't kind of just focus on the experience you have in real estate there's lots of other things that big companies are looking for so things like hobbies you do other jobs that you've had and um, things that you're passionate about I kind of I think people really want to know about what you're like and if you're going to work well in kind of their teams and things like that so that's something that um, I would suggest um, and then when maybe uh, you're unsuccessful in an interview ask for feedback one of the best things that I did was I got some really good feedback from one of the um, assessment centers I went to and a lot of the feedback I got, I wasn't expecting. And it was um, kind of very technical things. So kind of technical ways of answering questions, things like that. And I hadn't thought about um, that. I kind of went into the interview and didn't think about um, maybe the kind of more um, obvious things, if you were the kind of the way that they score you in questions and things like that. And I um, kind of managed to improve my interview technique through asking for feedback um, and kind of taking that on board. Um, and so that's another thing I would suggest. If you're applying to companies that have a bigger HR firm, a bigger HR team, um, I would suggest um, kind of looking online for interview tips and for uh, just kind of general assessment centre tips um, because there were things that I weren't, wasn't aware of and I didn't think I needed to necessarily prepare for, but so things like um, learning the t like good techniques of answering questions, um, kind of having a nice start and a kind of middle and an end. Um, and that's kind of something I picked up. Um, so just kind of overall, it's basically I, I got my job through, um, I, I went through the formal, um, kind of application for the job I got a rejection from Knight Frank um, and then I emailed someone that I knew from the Manchester office um, and I actually got an opportunity to go and have an interview there and kind of I think you know don't always think that the way that you're going to move forward and find a job is going through the necessary like necess is necessarily the most formal routes of them um, kind of applying I think you know definitely use the people you know um, you know, contacts and um, meet people, like con connect with people on LinkedIn and things like that. Um, and kind of don't be afraid to kind of just ask um, and kind of make those opportunities for yourself. Um, yeah, so that's not me. That's I'll great. Thanks, for, Thanks. That's great. Thanks very much, Holly. Some lovely tips there. I'm going to take people out of turn now because I'm going to switch and in hot pursuit go across to Katie because I think um, Holly, you've, you've set up Katie really to follow on very ne neatly and nicely in relation to networks. So um, can, can we go? Can we go to Katie? 
Yeah, sure. I wasn't expecting that, but yeah, I'll pop in now. Um, good evening, everyone. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Katie McManus. I'm currently a graduate development surveyor at HBD, um, formerly known as Henry Boot Developments. Um, I've been working there since August last year. I was in the same year as Holly at Sheffield Hallam studying real estate. Um, kind of going back to where I started, um, I've always been interested in property. I used to watch when I was younger, Homes Under the Hammer and uh, Place in the Sun, Home and Away. And to be honest, I still do that occasionally, particularly in lockdown when there's nothing else to do. Um, so that's how I kind of got into it. Con kind of got into it, wanted to be an estate agent um, and then found out of the wider world of property through my granddad and the more chartered surveying route. Um, so I decided to do some work experience. Um, I did some at Night Frank when I was in sixth form and I had a week's work experience placement um, and I had that experience and decided, yeah, this is something I want to do. So kind of my networking and my opportunities I've got have stemmed from that initially. So from that, I met someone at Muse Developments and then I went on to get a, a new, another few days at Muse Developments when I was in sixth form prior to when I came to university. And then started at Sheffield Hallam in 2016. And during that process, again, I kind of grasped every opportunity I could to gain work experience. So when I was on, I keep saying the word work experience because that's what I'm talking about. But when I was on work experience at Muse Developments, um, I met someone in the Knight Frank Sheffield office who was an agent on one of their developments. Um, I kept in contact with her when I went to Sheffield Hallam because obviously it's a local local office um, and in my reading week in first year I managed to get some work experience there and all this work experience that again essentially added to my CV which then when it came to interviewing for placements and other things like that I found it quite useful and quite beneficial that I'd have different experiences which strengthen my CV because it's quite hard to stand out from a great group of people when there's a lot of people like Holly said applying for the job one thing I will touch on before I forget that Holly just mentioned was that um, when she applied for Knight Frank through the formal process she didn't actually get it that was the same for my placement year at LSH um, not calling you out Mark but I, I applied through the formal LSH process and I got rejected but then I kind of took my own initiative <laughs> and um, emails through LSH in Sheffield that Sheffield Hallam put on networking events for in first and second year. Um, I connected with Adrian Lund through that and who then put me in touch directly with Gail, who's the head of the Manchester LSH office. So I directly emailed her through that contact um, and managed to secure my placement year at LSH Manchester. So during my placement year, um, I continued to meet a lot of people throughout that as well and um, different companies, different clients and just kept in touch with everyone from that using LinkedIn as the primary source. Um, whilst I was on my placement year, I was lucky enough to take part and be nominated by Sheffield Hallam to take part in the Women in Property Student Awards. So I took part in that um, when I was in my second year of university and then I got won the regional awards in Yorkshire and North East and managed to go to the finals and go on to be successful in that um, and that was while I was on my placement year as well and during that opportunity Savills were a regional sponsor um, and I was offered some work experience on the back of that um, and my interview there so I'd say to everyone um, starting off in real estate just grab every grasp every opportunity you can um, and kind of don't discount anyone because throughout your career because we're going to be working until we're like 70 probably by the time I come to retire um, you'll always probably come across people again likewise interviewing for dissertations you can meet re people and reach out to people through that and all these opportunities will come up so how I got into my role um, just to present day where we are now um, I've stayed in touch and connected with people through the Women in Property Forum. So it's, it's a great way as well through lockdown. It's not just for women, it's for every, every person to, you can get involved in. You don't have to be a member, you can join different events as non-members. Um, networking events have all moved online, so they're predominantly CPD events, but there are networking events that are ongoing and you kind of can go into breakout rooms and meet people that way, which is a nice thing to get in touch with throughout the pandemic. Um, but yeah, I, after I kind of had my time through Women in Property, I then went back 
um, the following year, I went to one of the student awards um, processes just to show my face and kind of, again, network and catch up with everyone. And um, Vivian Clements, who's one of the executive directors at HBD, was the guest speaker at that event. Um, and following the actual awards process um, and Vivian speaking, there's a networking section. And I just got chatting to Vivian and said, I'm, look, I'm really interested in development. It's something that I've never considered before. I really liked investment on my placement year, but um, I want to get involved in different things. And just because I'm quite obviously early on in my career. Um, and she said, well, why don't you come in for some work experience? So that's how I've got the job I have today. Um, I got a message on LinkedIn before I came back to university just saying, do you want to come in for a chat about a potential job opportunity, um, which I went to then. And on the back of that, I undertook some work experience and got off of the job. So I've never really gone down the traditional route of applying for jobs. It's just all through connections that I've kind of hung on to and made the most of. So it's definitely important to build your professional networks and Sheffield Hallam is a great place to start as I mentioned earlier LSH Sheffield every year used to it's obviously difficult at the minute and um, that's why I mentioned women in property they are different online networking events you can get involved in but through the university um, you can have guests I guess at the minute you might have guest lectures online as well I know Rob who's on the call gave a guest lecture um, to, our, to me in my final year and Holly in our final year at university was really good on the back of that, you know, you can connect on LinkedIn, you can message. I'm sure everyone on this panel tonight will be free to follow up on any questions you've got. So, yeah, that, that's it from me. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Katie. Excellent. Yeah, uh, networking in action. You're the living and breathing embodiment of that, really. So thanks for uh, giving us that perspective. So um, next, we, ju we jump uh, a couple of years of seniority to Will, please. Will, tell us about London. Evening, everybody. Um, hope everybody's well. Uh, I'm Will Game. Uh, I graduated Sheffield Hallam in 2019. I work at JLL in London in the West End office for strate strategic asset management team. I'll never learn how to say it. Uh, for some reason, I always have trouble. So I'll stick to Sam from now on. Um, I've worked in the Sam team for about four years. I initially joined uh, on two weeks work experience. So I was working on a brickyard cleaning bricks after my first year at uni. And it was not glamorous in any way. And I had two weeks of summer left and I just jumped at an opportunity to do some work experience in the team in, in London. Um, most of the time was spent at the pub or uh, going out on site. And I quite enjoyed that for some reason, uh, a bit of work and also some socializing and, and networking, as you say. And after I finished my work experience, I was, was adamant that I wanted to carry that on, uh, go into my second year and getting a placement in, in the same team. Um, the problem with asset management is, and this is the, what my boss has always said to me, is we don't accept placement students, we don't accept graduates. It's, uh, it's a, we only accept typically people that have been qualified for two years. So um, even though uh, he was telling me this, I, I was still set on it and I wanted to be a bit persistent and, and, try, and try and actually see if it was, if it was feasible. Um, my boss went to Sheffield Hallam and when I was on work experience, that, that came to my attention and we had a few chats and I asked him whether he'd consider doing a guest lecture. And that to me was um, sort of, was just me getting my name to him and him knowing who I was before I left after just being a, a two week work experience. So I went back to university for my, for my second year. And as a lot of you will know who have done placements, that's a very intense year for applying for jobs. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people don't actually have experience. Um, you might have a bit of work experience, but essentially you're, you're applying for an entry-level graduate role. Um, and it's, again, it's quite competitive you're competing with a lot of other universities. Um, I remember my housemates, there was eight, eight of us and we all did real estate and we we're all applying for the same jobs and uh, we're sort of getting quite competitive between us. We'd, we'd be waiting outside the interview rooms, one in, one out, and then afterwards go to the pub and talk about it. And it's, it's quite stressful, but um, I had a few terrible interviews. I had a few good interviews that I enjoyed, um, uh, but nothing was sticking. Um, I was going for roles at um, GVA in the waste management valuation sector, and I was then going for residential roles. So I wasn't set on anything really, but I still had the asset management team in the back of my mind. Um, I went through the JLL full process, and I had a um, full interview with the residential development team in London. 
and that interview went really well. I enjoyed it. It was nice and relaxed. Answered the tough questions at the beginning, and it then went to a conversation at the end, and I came out think, feeling very confident. And for some reason, I decided to take the lift up to the fourth floor to the asset management team and just walk by and say hi. I hadn't seen any of them for a year and a half. They probably wouldn't remember me. I was so nervous, but I just walked up to them, walked up to the laptop, uh, up to the computers and said, hi, um, nice to see you. And uh, I don't think they recognised me at first, but um, it soon clicked. And I went for a coffee with my boss in the uh, in-house cafe and we had a nice chat. And... A few weeks passed and then I got a call from JLL saying, um, you, yes, you've, you've got the residential development um, placement and I was delighted. But then they also said um, strategic asset management have somebody going on maternity leave and they open the opportunity up to you if you'd like to take it. So um, through persistence, and this is what my boss says, I'm not, not trying to be big headed, but just through persistence, not being, being read or anything, but um, just through persistence, it's, it, it just worked out. Um, the real problems came when I actually joined and I uh, realised why they don't take placement students through lack of experience. I just had my portfolio put in front of me and left for me to just fend for myself. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. And I think this comes on to my first bit of advice. It's a very hard now and I have a lot of sympathy for you working remotely. But when I was stuck and I didn't know what to do, I would just go to anybody in the office if I knew that retail sat in a certain area, I'd go and speak to somebody. They, they would always know, if they weren't the person, they'll know who you should speak to. One, it's a good way to get your name around and be, be keen. And two, you'll always end up getting the answer. And two people might have a different answer, but it's still better or different to what you may have initially thought. So speak to as many people as you can, get your name out there and uh, try and be a sociable network as much as possible. Uh, I then finished my placement and then uh, the team offered for me to carry on whilst I was back at university remotely. And that's the second challenge. I had to work remotely in my final year at university. Um, this is before Teams was actually a thing, so I couldn't just call people on my laptop. I didn't even know what Teams was in the first week of lockdown, but um, soon got, got to grips with it. Um, so I had to work in my final year at university, balancing my final dissertation exams with, with work. Uh, found a way to do it. They're very understanding. Working actually probably helps because, uh, as, as Holly and Katie said, you have the contacts that you can go to for your questions on dissertation, assignments, and you still have that experience and, and contacts you can go to. I uh, graduated in May 2019 and then joined back as a grad in the London office um, in, in September 2020. And then, um, so sort of obviously, went, worked for about six months and then went back into lockdown in, or into lockdown in March last year. And uh, considering nothing was open, couldn't go on any holidays, I just thought I'd give, give the APC a go. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of hard work, especially learning remotely and trying to balance work again. But um, managed to do it and, and completed my APC in um, awesome last year. So that's my story. Um, I'm sure we'll move into Q&As, but I thought I'd just say that I had a catch up with our, um, our, our talent acquisition team yesterday in anticipation for this meeting. Um, normally, JLL take, I think, around 50, 70 graduates a year. And um, that's, that's quite a lot. I think it's quite a lot for the country. I don't know what LSH is, but Mark, Mark, Mark will say. This year, I know that JLL is, is only 20. So it is really tough. And if you think about how many people are going to be applying, uh, applying, it's going to be very hard to stand out. And because there's so many people, the employment and, and the applications are very um, formulated, rigorous, and you'll do sort of inter virtual interviews and CVs. And it, again, it's really hard to shine without in that process until you get to the later stages. So it's about getting to the later stages. I have friends applying for graduate jobs who've just done real estate degrees and, and they're struggling. Nothing seems to be sticking. But the only advice that they have and that I have is, is and then Holly and Katie have said, is seize any opportunity you have. It might not be what you're thinking long term. But if in this year that you're, you're adamant you want a graduate scheme placement or graduate scheme, it might be better, or if you can't do it, go work in an estate agent. You might not want to work in residential long term. It's still experience. You've been proactive. Come next year when hopefully things are getting back to normal and um, the hiring numbers are a bit higher, you'll, you'll show that you've been proactive in a, in a really tough time. And that will definitely stand out to, to the HR. And that's the feedback they've given. It's not about, oh, I've got family in the property. And they, they know that a lot of the time is the case. 
you still need to be an individual and you need to show that you are interested and you're, you're keen no matter what and you, you, you like to get, get your feet to the door and get going. Uh, I think that's all I have to say for now. Great, thank you, Will. Thank you. That, 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 that's really interesting advice for the, for the present circumstance. Something we'll probably pick up on uh, back when we get to the panel panel um, Q and A. Um, can I invite VJ um, to the mic? Hi, uh, hi. Good evening. My name's VJ Singh. Um, so I'll jump straight into it. I um, graduated in 2012 with a degree in the built environment from Sheffield Hallam. After which point I started working for myself was self-employed doing small scale property development in and around Leeds. Um, and it was at that point that I realized that I wanted to become a chartered surveyor. So I went back to Sheffield Hallam in 2014 and did the conversion masters course part-time and actually had the pleasure of being in uh, Luke's law classes for my sins four hours on a Wednesday morning. <laughs> um, um, and at that, at that time, I was, um, yeah, like I say, uh, working for myself, doing small scale and property development and studying part time. Um, and somebody from LSH, actually Adrian, um, LSH Sheffield came in to do a guest lecture. And I, and I think there's a, there's a theme here. So I, I stayed in touch with him. And when the opportunity arose uh, for some work experience, I went um, and Probably about six months later, I got a call saying that there's a graduate opportunity in the LSH Sheffield office. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I was at LSH in, in, in the Sheffield office for probably about three years. Um, and um, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. And the training uh, offered by LSH is second to none. And, and all the graduates um, will, uh, like Rachel and uh, Katie and everybody will testify that uh, all the grads at LSH are like Mark's babies. <laughs> and, um, you know, he'll make, really make sure that you're looked after and he pulls out all the plugs to make sure you get through your APC. Um, so I passed my APC in 2018. Um, and at the same time, I was um, awarded the RICS Matrix Young Survey of the Year in valuation in 2018. And then I uh, went on to win the Rising Star of the Year award for uh, Countrywide. So at LSH, I lived, I lived in Leeds, but worked in Sheffield. And the commute got quite tiring, especially with uh, a newborn baby girl. So at the same time, I was offered um, a role by Jones Lang LaSalle in Leeds, uh, which is my hometown. Uh, and that was obviously a great experience. Got to work on some ultra, ultra high, um, high end properties uh, and some high profile clients. Um, but a year after that, I needed a fresh challenge. So I was approached by Bradley Hall to um, join their team as part of their expansion across Leeds and Manchester. So that, that's what I've been doing since um, and really enjoying it. But my, my experience in the property industry has been entirely positive. So I, I've been asked to sort of contribute to this discussion from a BAME perspective, but to be honest with you, I don't really know uh, what there is to say. I know there's a big underrepresentation of people from the BAME background in the uh, in the property industry, but that goes. Um, it's it's the same for um, women in property as well, uh, who are who are massively underrepresented uh, underrepresented at the moment. Um, but I think the society in general has come on a long way since, especially over the last probably five to ten years. Um, and, um, you know, the change that we're seeing can be only viewed as a positive thing. But my personal experience uh, has been entirely positive. And um, I know that won't be the case for everybody, but as a, as a turban wearing Sikh, my identity is quite distinctive. But at no point have I ever felt sort of discriminated against or excluded or anything due to race or anything like that. So, like I say, um, while studying and working thereafter, uh, my experience has been entirely positive. That's, that's great, VJ. And actually, I, I, I'm I'm not disappointed at all that you said that there isn't an issue. Well, you haven't actually. You haven't said that there isn't an issue, but your experience has been yeah. a positive one, and I think that is a powerful, yeah. um, a powerful message to, to, to get out there. Um, clearly, you're not denying that there are issues for many or some out there. I'm sure. That, I'm sure there is. Yeah. yeah. But I think as a story of success and achievement. 
let's just you know focus in on the fact that it's it's not been something that stood in your way and that's great to hear so that's a positive message in and yeah. of in and of itself so thank you very much for that um and then last but no not least in this sub panel um rachel thank you um so hi i'm rachel vickers um and i've been working in-house at hermes parcel net for the past year um I graduated from Sheffield Hallam back in 2015, uh, so nearly six years ago, which uh, always surprises me when I work it out because it definitely doesn't feel that long ago. Um, and I landed a, similar to, to many others, I landed a graduate position with Lambert Smith Hampton straight from, um, from graduating from Hallam. Um, and I was thoroughly supported throughout the APC journey um, at LSH, uh, and I'm not just saying that because Mark's on the call. <laughs> um, I do mean that um, the support at you know a, a consultancy like that, like LSH, you know it can't be rivaled. Um, the support is sort of second to none. Um, so I managed to charter in 2007, and then progressed upwards uh, from there within the Leeds agency team. Um, handling disposals and acquisitions of all different types of property um, for various different clients, private, uh, public clients, um, which was very interesting, but um, also very sort of uh, siloed, as you are in a department. In 2020, I then moved to an in-house role um, by moving to Hermes ParcelNet to manage their property portfolio of over 200 industrial units. Um, so really my focus this evening will be to provide my perspective of moving to an in-house role. So moving from one of the big property consultancies to a commercial occupier such as Hermes and what exactly is involved in the day-to-day -day role, how does it differ and really why not to discount an in-house role because I think a lot of graduates probably do um, when they are coming out of university. I think in-house sort of um, graduate roles are maybe not favoured as much as the big consultancies. So I think um, for me, the main, um, before I made the jump to Hermes, m one of my main concerns um, moving in-house was, was I gonna be pigeonholed in my career for good? Was that me just moving and being a management surveyor for, for the rest of my, my career? Um, where I couldn't get back to a consultancy if I wanted um, and I was just going to be in-house um, for, well, for the next sort of 50 years. So um, that literally couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, in fact, actually what I found is that working in-house, the job is extremely varied. Um, whereas in property consultancy, you are surrounded by other surveyors um, who each have their own uh, areas of expertise that you can, you can hopefully rely on. Um, when you are entering a company such as Hermes and being the in-house surveyor, you are normally the, in, you know, the sole expert there and therefore you have to wear so many more hats as you're no longer siloed into a specific department with a specific sort of area of expertise. You are overseeing and managing every part of that company's property portfolio. So some days you will be looking strategically at the upcoming lease events. Um, you can be acquiring new properties, dealing with dilapidations at the end of a lease. Um, you can be checking over rental invoices one day and sometimes even dealing with complaints from the landlord, which I had to do a lot of at Hermes because <laughs> our careers are, um, yes, infamous. Um, so working in-house certainly forces you to be much more well-rounded as a surveyor um, and you develop a much stronger knowledge of all aspects of property. And it certainly enabled me to actually consider many different jobs now going forward um, because of the new skills that I've learned that, you know, I, I wouldn't have picked up at one of those consultancies because, you know, you sort of get chucked in at the deep end and uh, forced to cover <laughs> a large, uh, a large sort of range of, of tasks and jobs. Um, so for me, moving in-house has been hugely beneficial. Um, one of the main differences that I found with working in-house is you're no longer working with um, property surveyors, you're no longer working with people that have an understanding of property. Um, actually, the people have a very limited understanding of property and therefore one of the main challenges is trying to limit the business expectations. 
um you know at Hermes I had I had situations where the business had, had come to me and said we need a property to be sourced we need a deal to be negotiated and a lease to be drawn up and completed and we need that within 48 hours now anyone in the property industry would would sort of <laughs> scoff at that and, and say impossible um but you know you, you're working with people that just don't understand the process and you have to work with them and and find a solution that you know works for them but also is realistic um so uh, you know the team the team don't all, always understand this and they have their own pressures as well which they they pass on to you naturally um uh, for example you know if, if a lease event uh, say you have to move out of a, a building on a friday and there's been an issue with the new unit that you're meant to unit move into you know that that causes the business a huge problem in terms of business continuity because all of a sudden you've got nowhere to put or run your business from from that friday you know there's a significant problem for it so um i would certainly say there's a lot more stress <laughs> involved with them um, with working in-house um a lot of pressure on your shoulders um because there's no sort of hiding hiding away from anything um but it isn't all stress and chaos. Um, working in-house provides a lot more job satisfaction um, than I actually had at um, sort of a property consultancy. Um, you know, a property consultancy, you do your job, you get your deal done uh, and you get your invoice in, which, you know, is fantastic. But working in-house, what I found is, you know, once, a, once a, a deal has been done, actually, you know, I get to go and see that property in action and I get to see, you know, the lorries coming in and out of it. I get to see the couriers using it. And actually that's, that's a huge part of the satisfaction for, for, for me. Um, so the job satisfaction I've also found in house is, 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 is a lot more. I think the message that I really wanted to get across in this is basically don't discount working in house. Um, it will certainly enable you to gain a really strong understanding of many different aspects of property. Um, you know, I, I think the, the advice that I'd probably give is just make sure that, you know, if you are joining or looking to join as a graduate, make sure they have a really good support system for your APC or make sure they have contacts that will be able to support you because, you know, the, the, the big property consultancies, they have systems set up for APC. They have so many graduates coming through um, that, you know, the, the process is all there. Um, whereas in-house, they don't, they have much smaller property teams. You know, you're looking at uh, two or three in, in a property team. So it's not really set up for the APC process. So just, you know, if you're going for an interview with an in-house role, just make sure that you are really questioning that APC sort of system and, and how they're going to be able to support you. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to say on in-house. Basically, it's not as scary as it sounds. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to start the questioning by, by asking you a question that I think comes out of what you were saying. And okay. you, can, you can decline to answer that if you wish. But I'm trying to think of a polite way of saying, so do you think you will stay with working side for the rest of your career now? Have you got a taste for it? Or so that's, it uh, <laughs> that's a very timely question, Luke, uh, because I am actually due to join Colliers on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that answer. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> um, so, no, I am due to join Colliers on Monday. Um, not because I wanted to leave Hermes. I was incredibly happy at Hermes. Um, but actually, an opportunity has sort of landed at my feet to work on the Vodafone estate and be the estate manager there. So, they're promoting me from estate surveyor to estate manager. And it's a much bigger portfolio. And it's more responsibility. So... I'm still, I'm going to be doing a little bit of both. I'm sort of doing in-house, but also at a property consultancy. So, um, yeah, timely question. <laughs> it goes to prove you can move, you can move backwards and forwards in the way that you were hinting at at the start. So thank, Absolutely. You, thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so the next question is one perhaps for um, Holly and Katie and, and Will, you might want to chip into this as well, trying to focus towards the junior end of the equation. Um, it's often said by people commenting on the effects of COVID that the generation who really suffered are the people starting out in their working lives because they're not getting a chance to see sort of at desk side um, how people do their jobs and to, 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 to get that feel for the office. Um, 
any comments from the three of you about whether you feel you have missed out because you've spent so much time working remotely? What ways have your employer tried to give you that sort of soft learning um, aspect? I'll, I'll jump in first yeah. if, if that's all right. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that it is tricky. It's not easy, but everyone's in the same position. Um, and what I would say is HBD as an employer have been great. Um, you've, we've got team calls, people just check in and ask what happened on my weekend, which I think is the conversation that does get lost a lot on this online thing. Um, what I would say to people is don't be afraid to pick up the phone and speak to someone it's quite easily now with Microsoft Teams or to just you know drop someone a quick Teams message rather than actually picking up your mobile and giving someone a call and chatting it through um, when I first joined I was I'm quite a confident person but I was quite nervous to keep ringing someone and keep bothering them but actually after a week um, Tom who's my line manager checked in with me and was like how are you finding it I was just honest and he was like look if you literally if you just want to ask what I had for breakfast ring me if you've literally got a one hour if you've got a one minute question about oh where do I find this on the on the drive just ring me so I think it is just everyone's in your employer sh should um understand your situation and it is tricky but don't just keep pushing on and um yeah be confident to ask questions okay Holly any thoughts yeah, it's, um, I was kind of lucky enough that I started um, my job in September. So before Manchester was put into tier three or four, I even managed to um, get out for a, a drink or two with uh, a couple of colleagues, which was really nice. Um, but it has been tricky. I'd say it's, it's quite difficult to um, kind of get the same sort of communication you're able to do in the office. I kind of missed miss things that I really benefited from on my placement year like you know just sitting next to someone and being able to ask a really silly stupid question and being able to get a direct answer and you know sometimes it does feel like you might you're making a bit of a big thing out of something little if you're sending someone an email or you know picking up the phone um but you know like Katie said I think everyone everyone's struggling in their own different way I've been quite glad that I haven't got uh, kids to homeschool or um, anything like that so um, it's been tricky but you know I think I'm I'm looking forward to kind of getting back into the office I definitely miss that aspect of um, of work um, and I think hopefully it won't be too long till we're back there. Okay thank you. Uh, Will? Anything? Yeah I think the, I think there is a perk. Um, I was grateful to actually worked in the office for a few years before we came to lockdown and and the perk for me was was when lockdown happened and then there are um, drawbacks but the perk was actually gaining a bit more independence um, because you can't just turn your head and ask somebody a question and you, which you think is quite simple you think is quite simple um, you actually sort of can really consider it yourself and you do consider you, you think it through thoroughly before you sort of ring them and, and think about ways to make potentially waste their time so I gained a different level of independence through working from home um, which I probably may have been slower to get to um, by staying in the office and just being com in a comfortable position. Um, and it, it is it is harder. Uh, and I think the second thing is that um, maybe the, the more experienced generations also are, are finding it a bit tough. I'm speaking to members in my team, they enjoy um, getting feedback from younger people. We, we look at situations differently. We might not be as, as, as experienced, but we'll have a different viewpoint and even if we're not right, it, it, they'll still listen to you and still be interested in what you have to say um, because you may give them a new perspective. They may have a fixed perspective that doesn't work in this world anymore. We're, we're used to this um, social distancing working um, just, just through technology. We, we sort of can take it on quite easily. Um, so I th there's perks and benefits. It, it is hard, but there are some perks. Thank you. That, 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 that's given me a, a, an interesting follow on question, which I was trying to work out what I was going to ask VJ and Rachel as the um, as, as the sort of equitable spread of questioning around the panel. And you've just given me a free one. Uh, and it's as old people, VJ and Rachel, um, <laughs> this is this is what Will said, <laughs> what I've said. But, you know, how difficult have you found it adjusting to new ways of working, given that you're all so old and um, uh, that experience stuck in, stuck in uh, stuck in older ways of doing things because you did learn in the office doing things face to face bj it, it age before beauty rachel <laughs> <laughs> well I, I i will just say that i um when i joined hermes 
I, I actually haven't worked in the office since I joined Hermes. So I have not known how to work in the office with, with Hermes. So um, I, I would say it's, I certainly understand what the, you know, what the, what the graduates have said when they've been talking about that fear of picking up the phone for a simple question, which you wouldn't normally have in an office because you could just turn to someone and just ask that question. But making a phone call out of it, I can completely agree with that. It does seem like you're just going to annoy someone, but that's not the case, um, especially when you've got things like Teams and um, Zoom, like it does feel a lot more informal. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, working from home, I think, it, I don't really find it that much different. I'm still able to get on with everything that I need to do. I'm still able to contact my colleagues. Um, it, it's really not been all that different apart from the social side of it. And I, I'm not sure about you, VJ. I think um, it's it's a difficult one from the practical side of Savane because especially when you need to go out to properties and inspect, um, when you're looking at defects, when you're measuring up, that's obviously you can't do any of that if you're not out on site. Um, also, I think there's a lot to be learned, maybe not the technical skills, but a lot of the softer skills, um, which you learn from working in an office, like um, when you're just joining on a phone call in a negotiation, and things like that. Um, you know, some of those softer skills and uh, are quite difficult to pick up from behind a screen, um, but it's, I suppose it is what it is and you've just got to make the most of the situation situation that we're in um and um just when, when everything's back to normal much practical experience and hands-on uh, experience as possible meet as many people as you can speak to as many people as you can um the other thing I, i'd like to touch upon is as a graduate you're not expected to know everything about everything um it's your attitude that, that, that counts more than anything. So if, if anybody's stuck or you're not sure about something or you want to discuss something, um, it's definitely the best thing to do is pick up the phone and talk about it. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, thank you much, VJ. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to wrap it up there to keep ourselves moving along to time. Um, and actually, VJ's last comment nicely links us across to the employer perspective. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nikki and she's going to belt out a song on her piano. And um, we're all gonna we're all gonna move to the second sub panel. I'm saving that for the end, Luke. Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, thank you very much, Luke, and thanks very much to all the uh, panelists so far. It's been uh, really interesting. So, yes, as Luke said, we're moving now to look at it from from the other end of the telescope, I suppose, a bit more from the um, employer's perspective. Um, and we've got a range of uh, a really good range of. Uh, uh, speakers talking about um, some of the aspects of that. So um, we've got uh, Stephanie Mackay from Hayes Recruitment, who's going to have a look at the, re the recruitment position uh, in the UK. Um, and then uh, Mark, who's already been uh, spoken about widely and uh, <laughs> favorably by some of our other panelists, is going to talk about what real estate employers are looking for uh, in graduates. So again, that, that employer perspective. And then Josephine Ford, um, who uh, works uh, as a, uh, uh, alongside her day job doing uh, chairing APC panels, is going to have a talk about what the APC assessors are looking for. And that will tie in really nicely, I think, with um, some of the things that um, Will and VJ have said about um, APC uh, so far. And then um, Rob Sim of Europa Capital is going to talk about um, how real estate employers can sort of support students and some of the um, other aspects to what employers um, sort of offer to uh, students and, and the wider community, I guess. So um, if we, Stephanie, if we could uh, start off with you, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, for having me. I think I'm probably the only person on the panel without a property qualification. So I'm, I'm very privileged to be here. <laughs> um, but I um, so I yeah work for Hayes uh, Property and I specialise in uh, recruitment for surveying. Um, and I particularly focus on real estate and I have a colleague um, in our office in Leeds who looks after um, the kind of other disciplines, quantity surveying, building surveying, uh, and that side. So I've done this current role that I'm doing now, um, specialising in property for 10 years. I've just had my 10th 
Hay's birthday, uh, which reminded me that I'm definitely now in the, in Luke's old category, which is <laughs> um, a bittersweet, but never mind. Um, so I started off um, with the, so I worked while I was doing my degree um, for Job Centre Plus, and I did CV writing, interview techniques, and helping people kind of find work. And that was a job that I did full time while I was um, in my holidays at university. And although it's not on the property side, that was what got me into the, the, the Hayes role in the kind of recruitment world. So in terms of the uh, perspective from an employment side, We've recently done our, um, Hayes do a, um, a national um, salary guide and survey of recruiting trends every year. And we did this um, just coming into the early part of, uh, of this year. So it, it's, it's pretty up to date. And um, the picture is, um, it was uh, interesting uh, what we were saying about the, the JLL um, graduate recruitment numbers sort of changing. And I think that the picture is, um, when I started working for Hayes in recruitment in 2011, we were just coming out of the first recession and the picture is not as bleak as it has been um, in the past. Um, it's actually, there are pockets of, um, you know, quite, quite decent positivity and, and reasons for optimism. Um, it's just finding where those opportunities are. And I think that probably being flexible in terms of the kinds of roles and kinds of businesses that you're looking at is going to help open things up. So we found recently that, 54% of all of the employers we um, would, would kind of work with in the sector expect their uh, business activity to increase and 74% of them are expecting to hire in the next um, in the next year. So actually that shows that that positivity going forward and then the, the number of roles available. So um, although they might, I think what, what companies can be doing is that rather than being quite aggressive with their graduate intake from the central perspective, what they'll probably do more of is the recruitment at local level, um, which you know a couple of people have already said that they found their graduate roles through non-traditional routes. And that's that's where I would, so I would recruit for all of the big um, property consultancies and a lot of um, smaller independent businesses as well. And often the ones who have their graduate schemes, I recruit graduate roles for them because they're on a really strict timeline across the, the year and they have annual um, sort of dates when they have an intake and actually if a business you know somebody leaves or they win some new work or something changes with their portfolio they need to recruit heads at different times of year so actually if the um, national numbers are lower that doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to have roles in their local offices as well um, one of the things that's come out recently as well is a kind of shift in terms of what employers are looking for in the softer skills. So um, communication and interpersonal skills are really, really high. Um, and they always have been to an extent, but I think certainly now the candidates who can um, distinguish themselves with their ability to communicate and that, you know, it links in with that networking piece, that ability to sort of sell yourself and, and also get out there and understand the market. Um, building rapport quickly so if that's something you're really comfortable with great if it's not it's a good area to kind of work on to make yourself more attractive to employers um, ability to adopt change is at really high on the list and I think particularly obviously over the last year everyone's had some kind of change happening um, so the people who really are able to um, not be scared by that and really go forward are the ones who are going to have the advantages um, and uh, Willard said that he um, gained independence by kind of uh, working from home and that problem solving is another um, another thing that the employers are looking for at the moment. So the ability actually to go to somebody with a solution rather than just asking lots of questions all the time. So I think that the more you gather in terms of your experience, the more able you are to kind of tick off these softer skills because if you're competing with lots of other people who all have real estate degrees and all have similar kind of qualifications actually it's these soft skills which are going to make you really stand out so communication check adapting to change problem solving um, and i think some of the um perhaps more traditional skills like that ability to just pick up the phone to somebody to solve an issue or things like that other things as well that are really really good because employers definitely want to see people who are really good at tech and have good um, kind of knowledge and, and ability with that, 
but also there is that kind of old-fashioned thing of just going up to somebody in the office and, and having a conversation um which you you need to be able to demonstrate as well to really kind of stand out so the recruitment position i think is probably if you look at um all of the headlines you know they are probably less optimistic than it looks like actually in the kind of property sector um, we've had over the last year there has been um a uh, increase in average salaries in the sector of just over one percent um, which is in line with uh, the kind of UK national um, average, which is, is positive because obviously not all sectors are, are going to have had that growth. Um, and there, I think that there's probably um, just some adaptation to do in terms of the flexibility of perhaps broadening the kind of roles that you apply for and um, broadening the skills and the softer skills that you can demonstrate on the CV. Um, but certainly um, it's, you know, it, it's not... It's, it's not all doom and gloom out there. There's definitely going to be a lot of exciting opportunities. And I think going forward into the next couple of years, we're hopefully going to see um, quite a lot of movement in terms of activity, which generates those, you know, those new positions. Um, so I think we, oh, one thing I did want to mention actually as well is that if you do get a chance, the Hayes website has loads of resources for this kind of thing so we've actually just done a piece about virtual onboarding and some of the challenges that you can have there and um, there's quite a lot of information about how to prep for virtual interviews um i i used to when when we were able to come and deliver a kind of presentation on how to find roles how to build a network how to work with your recruitment consultants who are relevant in your areas as well so um i'll uh, you know I'll, I'll send out a couple of links um to that which perhaps can be circulated because there's some extra information there about how to kind of um, apply your skills in this current market which you can send out um, so I think that was that's probably my piece <laughs> um, and just like best of luck really as we go into the new you know the next next world of the uh, post post graduation <laughs> Thank you very much, Steph. Thanks. That's really helpful and some really uh, useful tips there, I think, that people can uh, pick up and apply when they're going in. So, um, Mark, can we move on to you now, please? Certainly. Thanks, Nikki. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, and again, just uh, say to Luke, um, obviously, thanks for thanks for having me and inviting me um, you know, to come and talk to you tonight. It's something that I always I always really enjoy um, you know, as part of my role is actually being able to get in front of students and, to, you know, share obviously some some thoughts and opinions and, and hopefully offer some some advice, too. So, yeah, my name is is Mark Windsor and I'm the talent and development manager um, at Lambert Smith Hampton. Um, I've been working for the company for six and a half years. Um, and if um, Steph thought she was in the old category, then I, I absolutely 100% am. <laughs> um, so I've, I'm, but I'm, I'm also, if it makes you feel better, Steph, I'm not a, um, a property person, so I don't, I don't have a, a property qualification. There's two of them. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually. Um, an, an HR person. Um, I've, I've, I've kind of pretty much always worked as, as part of an HR team, but with um, a specialism of, of training and, and learning and development. So that's, that's very much my thing. Um, at LSH, um, you know, I'm, I'm very heavily involved in the recruitment of, of what I would call kind of early, early careers. Um, so that would include apprentices, placement year students, um, and also, also graduates, um, kind of from what we would call experienced hires, so qualified graduates onwards, they're, they're generally not something I'd, I'd get involved in. Um, but I also, aside from that, I look after um, that kind of entire learning and development and, and training function at LSH as well. So really the kind of graduate and early career side is just is just kind of one element um, of what I do. Um, that said, um, it's probably one of the most enjoyable elements of what I do and, and obviously tonight you know I've, I've been bigged up quite a lot um, you know by by VJ and, and Rachel and, and also Katie and uh, I have to say from my point of view I've you know I've had the pleasure um, you know of working alongside all three of them and, and actually kind of you know taking them through or well, certainly with with Rachel and VJ you know taking them through um, you know the APC process and and you know now it's really great to see you know them them doing so well in their careers and, and vj you know nailed it um i do feel a bit proud dad sometimes you know when i i see you know 
I, I can recall interviews and I can recall sort of meeting people for the first time you know, seeing them um, and then sort of taking them on their APC journey and, and you know, they qualify and then they're kind of out in the, the big wide world. And then often they, you know, they fly the nest and, and leave and go elsewhere. So it's, it's always great to sort of see and catch up. And it's amazing the number of names that I come across, you know, on events like this that I think, oh, you know, I've, I've you know, you either used to work at LSH or, or maybe, you know, I can actually remember interviewing you. You may not have ended up at LSH, but, you know, I can kind of, you know, remember the names so um it's it's something that i i, I really really love and um you know i'm, I'm incredibly proud of, of our uh, you know of our grad scheme at, at lsh so i think you know in terms of um what i've what i've been invited to talk about today is really just offering you know an employer's perspective on um you know what we're real estate employers are ultimately looking for in our you know in our graduates um, and I think um, everyone else has, before me has actually done such a grand job because you're probably just going to hear me echo um, you know really elements of what everyone has, has kind of said so far um, you know all, all some really really good advice um, so I'll, I'll kind of offer you some, you know, some additional things. I think probably, you know, the easiest thing I thought, oh, you know, is it going to be just a list of competencies where, you know, I could say, well, you know, we're looking for good communication skills and, um, you know, commerciality and being commercial minded and those kind of things. And, and yes, they they do all apply and I'll maybe, you know, cover some of those things, but um, I, I'll pick out on some of the things that I think have already kind of been mentioned and just kind of give my perspective on those um, at all, because there have been there have been some really, really great points that have been listed. Um, I think probably the first thing to say is that, you know, we would see, and I'm talking here in, in an ordinary year, um, you know, we, we would have our, um, and we would follow a lot of other companies and that we have our very set, you know, timetable, Steph's already, already alluded to this, but, you know, we typically would open up our applications, um, you know, in the autumn time, um, so we would have final year students, you know, the moment they kind of rejoin university for their final year, um, we would all open up our applications, um, you know, the, the, CVs would start coming in, they'd then be shortlisted. Typically in January, you know, we'd start doing our, our, our interviews and our assessment centers. Um, and then from pretty much about February offers, you know, would, would start going out. Um, it's obviously over the past, um, you know, 12 months, it's, it's been very different. And, and many companies have obviously had to change their, you know, change their, their strategy as, as far as that's been concerned. Um, but, you know, equally now, you know, we're still getting, um, you know, loads and loads of, of applications in. Um, and, and, you know, the first thing that I'm going to acknowledge is, is that it's actually, you know, very, very tough out there. You know, it's going to be ultra competitive. I think, uh, you know, Will, Will touched on this. Um, you know, I think generally numbers are going to be lower. I think, you know, we are going to recruit and we are going to be recruiting um, people, but I think overall numbers will be lower. So, you know, you've got kind of the class of 2021, you know, that are going to hopefully graduate, you know, in the summer that are going to come out, um, you know, and are going to be looking for roles. There are going to be fewer roles, but you've also got added to that potentially the class of 2020 that maybe we're hoping to have started, you know, some roles last autumn, but for whatever reason, you know, haven't done. So I think, you know, this year is going to be, particularly tough if I'm being honest but as Steph said you know I think there are some you know some green shoots out there um, you know I know from our perspective at LSH we've already seen this year some graduate opportunities come up and, and my my personal prediction is for this year that you will see I know some of the, the larger companies have been you know have already stuck to their kind of like autumn process and and you know some of you may actually have been going through a you know an interview process at the moment um, but I think we will continue from now until kind of September, we will start to just see a kind of almost a constant stream of companies looking to fill opportunities ad hoc. I know certainly that probably that's what LSH will be doing. I'd be very surprised if we have a bunch of new graduates that are actually starting on, you know, the same date in, in September. I think, you know, what we'll probably see is, you know, we'll recruit on an ad hoc basis. And, um, you know, between now and then, you know, we will start to see, um, you know, recruitment being done as and when, um, you know, vacancies arise. Business, you know, we, we're, we're doing very well at the moment. 
I think far better than we probably expected to. Um, so results so far, you know, the financials have, have been great and, and we're continuing to, you know, to grow. And, and, you know, so having sort of tightened very much over the past 12 months now, I think, you know, we're, we're starting to need to recruit because um, certain parts of the business, particularly, you know, the, I would say the consultancy side of things, um, they're doing really well. So teams like valuation, teams like property management, you know, really, really, really going great guns at the, at the moment. So in terms of, um, you know, what, what we're, uh, you know, what we're looking for, um, I think one of the biggest things for me, given that we will typically see literally hundreds of CVs that will come in, um, you know, and I think Katie is probably testament, she made mention of it, that, you know, quite often we will let a lot of very good people go. So there'll be some very good students with some very good CVs um, that will simply slip through the net that, you know, may not get you know what they want kind of first time so I think um and, and Holly um and Katie mentioned this you know just being persistent is really really good so if you do have any um you know local contacts um you know that you can you know people that you know maybe that you've done work experience for always worth I would echo that always worth just you know putting in an email um or a phone call um because often you may get more luck you know sort of you know locally you know at maybe some of the regional offices than you may if you've you know if you're just going for sort of you know the big the big London offices um and I think on that note, flexibility um, and adaptability are, are, are absolutely crucial at the moment. Um, it's already been mentioned, um, you know, London itself is incredibly competitive. And I would probably say that year on year, probably about 80% of all the applications that we get are for London. And I think there is, has been for a while almost, uh, it's seen among students as a bit of a rite of passage that for many people I've kind of got to got to go and do London you know that's 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 what I've got to go and do and you know maybe later on you know if I'm from another part of the country I'll, I'll go back there but you know I've, I've kind of got to do that um, I think it's up, utter nonsense to be fair um, I think you know there are some really good strong um, you know regional hubs out there Manchester Leeds um, you know Birmingham you know there, there are plenty of big cities out there that have really really good buoyant markets out there so I think particularly at the moment with so fewer jobs available is actually just just be flexible and be prepared to consider your options um, you may get better luck um, applying you know for regional offices than you may if you're you know if you're going to do London. Um, and, and actually, one, one thing that's actually really nice is that Hallam, I know, as a university, typically a lot of the students um, that go to Hallam are, are often from the north and are from the kind of locality. So, you know, we'll actually look to, to for jobs in and around, you know, the area as well. So, you know, we get far fewer probably applicants from Hallam that are looking for, for London. There obviously are some, um, but actually it is a university that tends to support, you know, the, the local job market as well, um, which is fantastic. Um, so how do you, how do you make yourself um, stand out, right? That's the, that's the, that's the $50 million um, question. I think um, one of the big things is originality. Um, you know, it's, it's, show show us you um we look at your cvs we can see your um you know academic grades um you know if you're doing an msc we can see what you've done at bsc we can see you know what degree you've got if you're just doing a bsc you know we can obviously look at you know your a level grades you know which is which is kind of important but you know really that's that's just half of it um and again what's been mentioned already is that it's actually all about you we you know we are looking at, at your potential to come into our business um, and to fit in to the team. Um, so, you know, a certain level of, of confidence, um, you know, we will really want to see your, your personality. Um, I've dropped using the word passion because it kind of makes me cringe slightly. So I've I, I've opted for now to use the word um, enthusiasm. I've heard at so many interviews. Yeah, well, you know, I've got a real passion for property and I'm a bit. Um, so I think I think enthusiasm hunger you know it, it, it's often in the right people we we just kind of see it naturally in abundance people that kind of really you can tell this is really really what they want to do so um you know i think in terms of um you know when you're sat in an interview whether that's kind of face to face or whether that's done remotely just just you know in your answers just just try and show um you know some some real enthusiasm and and, and a hunger and a desire and, and let us kind of know that this is this is really what you you want to do um a, a originality as, as i've mentioned is massive 
there are certain universities who shall remain nameless, and I'm pleased to say that Sheffield Hallam are most definitely not one of them, um, that will coach their graduates to within an inch of their life to get through the recruitment processes that a lot of the large companies um, put in place. Um, and that's great and it's all very well, but the difficulty there is it's literally like a conveyor belt. It's just one person following another and they look and sound, the, I mean, not literally look the same, but they, they just look and sound all very similar because, you know, they're, they're all told, you know, the really good answers and they all say the same thing. Um, and it becomes really, really difficult and almost quite tiresome at times, you know, and you, one person comes in and the next person who says exactly the same thing and then the next person says the same thing. What I particularly like about Hallam students and I, you know, I'm quite happy to say this is that there is more of a sense of indiv individuality and, and, and personality. So I think be you, um, don't be the person that you think we want you to be, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it, it's all very well coming along and giving sort of highly polished answers, but it's often quite easy for employers. You know, when we're sat there at an interview, it's often quite easy to, to kind of see, see through that. Um, so by all means, you know, certainly practice and particularly with your competency questions and your, you know, behavioral competency questions, you know, so the classic tell me about a time when, you know, I don't know, you work successfully as part of a team. By all means, come up with a good answer, but try and make it sound authentic and try and make it sound um, original. One of the ways I think, you know, really, really it is so competitive out there and, and you've really got to work hard and it'll be tougher than ever at the moment to kind of make yourself stand out so when you are thinking of your answers that you're going to give and you know you're likely to be asked about a scenario so tell me in a time when you did this or can you think back to a time when you you know you you demonstrated this particular quality try and and think beyond the obvious um try and think you know of situations that maybe the person sitting next to you you know won't come up with so you've really got to dig deep um you know um, the classic example the team you know the um, being an excellent team player so often you know I, we just hear the same thing that oh you know for the gentlemen out there or maybe you know with women as well you know I played rugby or I played hockey or I played in this team you know it's all very well and I'm, I'm not discounting using sport and his example but it's just something that we hear a hell of a lot of and you just by saying that you played in the first 15 rugby you know and therefore demonstrated that I can work as part of a team you don't really make yourself stand out if that's all you've got, really try and think of a really good example and think about what you actually contributed. What did you do, you know, when you worked in that team to really kind of make yourself stand out from the crowd? Um, so really try and be cute and try and be really clever, you know, with some of your, your answers there, because so often it's someone will just give me a bit of a left field answer and I'll go, oh, you know, oh, that's cool. I've, I've not heard that before. Um, that was actually a really, really good answer. And it's one that no one else has said before. So really try and think hard, really try and think hard about how you can stand out and maybe say something different about yourself that is going to be different from, you know, the, the, the rest of the people that are going to be applying. Um, because, you know, you're not just up against, you know, your, your fellow Hallam students, you know, you've got all the other universities that do the RICS accredited degrees who are all looking, you know, for the same jobs. Um, I think, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, we're looking at we're looking at potential. Um, we're looking at your ability to sort of come into a team, you know, to, to kind of really fit in. So I think a certain level of, of confidence is, is very important. Um, it's been mentioned so many times here about the ability to pick up a phone, not to be shy, not to be afraid to ask lots of questions. And probably in, you know, where there's kind of. Um, you know, how we're working at the moment, working remotely and, and being based from home, um, it's more important than ever to demonstrate those those kind of skills. So, you know, whether you're doing it over Teams, whether you're doing it on the phone, we don't have the luxury at the moment of kind of that face to face contact. So you've got to be confident, um, you know, in, in using the technology and getting used to Teams and, and you know, picking up the phone and really not being afraid, um, you know, to, to ask lots of questions. You know, teams that typically take on graduates are used to taking on graduates and they will know, VJ mentioned it earlier, he said, you know, you're not as graduates expected to know absolutely everything. So, you know, really there. Um, you know, don't be afraid and don't be shy. We're, we're li more likely to be suspicious of people that kind of sit there and don't ask questions and say anything than we are of, of people that will, you know, actively ask lots of questions. Um, I think 
one thing you can do as well to make yourself stand out with when you're writing, you know, your CVs and your cover letters um, is is really just um, to, to tailor it as well towards each company that you're um you know, your your recruit, your sorry, you're applying to. Um, we see a lot of the cut and paste. It's quite obvious when people have just cut and pasted. You know, when they're sending a generic application and it's going out to CBRE, JLL, Knight Frank, Savills, LSH. You know, you name it. So again, try and think about the company that you are applying to, and try and tailor, um, you know, your CV and cover letters according to. Um, you know, what that company, you know, in terms of their culture, and if you see anything about their values, try and tailor it to the, um, you know, the themes that you see kind of running, running through there, because that will make you stand out. And we will be sitting there thinking, oh, great, we've well, actually really thought, you know, mm -hmm. uh, about our culture of this company. Um, it, it's quite often, you know, we can see through quite easily when people have just done the old cut and paste approach. And, and you've got to be very careful there because I have seen many CVs and I've actually sat in front of interviews where people um, have forgotten who they're interviewing with and have actually mentioned, you know, another company. Um, and you can imagine how well that goes down. Um, so, um, yeah, so many, so many other, you know, so much good advice has, has been given. Um, I think Holly mentioned hobbies and interests. Um, now, this is this is something I really love. Um, it's something that I will always ask at the end of, a, of an interview. You know, when you're not working hard, what do you do? You know, how do you relax? What are your hobbies? What are your interests? You know, what what kind of floats your boat? What makes you tick? Um, I love asking that question because that does really give you a sense of like the individuality and the personality. And quite often people will come alive when they're talking about this or if we ask you something about you know, a particular hobby that you do. Um, and don't worry about how wacky or, or how left field or, or nerdy or geeky or whatever that particular hobby or interest is. Um, you know, it's it's really good to put those down because it will help you again stand, you know, stand out from from the crowd, which is which is fantastic. Um, I'm just trying to think, oh, Joe. While I was, everyone else was presenting, I was scribbling down so many notes. Um, I think, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, yes, I'm going to be slightly. You're going to stop me there. No, so that's fine. Don't feel that you have to search for more things to say. You've you've given us a cornucopia of lovely stuff. Lovely. And 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 and, and to give you a bit of a break, um, shall we shall we just move on? Um, yeah, please do. <laughs> So thank you very much. Thank so, you. Right. Not being yeah, low, but uh, but but there we are. For the, for yeah. the greater good, I thought I'd better just jump in. Fab. Cheers. There's some really useful points there, Mark, and really, it's really helpful for people, I think, to know that they can be themselves in these situations because obviously, you know, it's a stressful situation for people, but it's really valuable for them. Absolutely. So um, moving on to Josephine, we're going to talk a bit more about the sort of next stage, the APC stage. If I can hand Absolutely. over to you, Josephine. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, as everyone else said, it, it's such a delight to be here. I've got such fond memories of Sheffield Hallam and um, you know, really kick started my career. So uh, thank you for the invite, firstly. Um, some of the things we've been talked about, they flow through into the APC process as well. I think we talked some of the interview things. And for me, and you know, just to, to, for everyone to understand, is the property is a people business. And that goes throughout the whole, whole of your career. And you know, being personable um, and coming across and showing who you are as a person and your other interests is so important. Um, and just being enthusiastic. I think, yeah, I think that word's been used before, but it, it is critical. Um, so that just kind of set the scene on that. So who am I? Um, so I'm Joe Ford. Uh, I'm an assistant director at Deloitte Real Estate. Um, I was at Shefford Hallam from 2006 to 2010, which now feels like quite a long time ago. Um, I started a graduate scheme with DTZ. Um, they then turned into Cushman and Wakefield, and I was there for seven years. Um, just to point out, I actually did, took a sabbatical when I was there. I had a year out and I went traveling around the world. Um, and I actually feel like that was one of the best career decisions I ever made, which sounds a little bit counter to what you might think. But I think getting that extra experience and showing that you have a life outside of work. Um, for me, it was a massive plus. Um, I then joined Deloitte in 2017, which is the same year that I became an APC assessor. So I became chartered in 2012 and became an assessor in 2017. And then last year I actually became a chair. Um, so when you do your APC, you have three people on your panel. You have two assessors, chair. Uh, I've announced both of those seats and I continue to assess 
uh, going forwards. So what's important about when you get to your APC? One of the key things we look for is, are you a safe pair of hands? Do you know your stuff? And can you be kind of trusted to represent the, possess the profession in the best possible way? I see a lot of candidates coming through who just haven't quite grasped the concepts. I think there's one thing about knowing the facts, but there's another thing about actually understanding a little deeper level in that. And the advice I'll give people in that respect is be curious. So when you're working with colleagues and they're talking you through why you do something, ask the question, but why do we do it like that? What's the reason? Why, why wouldn't we do this option? Um, a lot of the candidates tend to kind of tell us a story as to what done, but when you actually ask them, how did you come to that decision? It becomes quite apparent that they didn't come to that decision. They followed the advice of someone else they were with. So the candidates that really shine are those that said, oh, well, I considered these options, A, B, and C, and actually I decided that B was the best option for these reasons. So for me as a, an assessor, I can really see that you've understood what you're doing and that you, you have that wider breadth of experience. The, 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 the aspect about being personable as well, I think is very topical and especially in this virtual world. So APC assessments are now held online and they probably will be for the rest of this year. Firstly to say it hasn't made much of a difference. The process is very similar to how it was before, um, albeit you're not in a room, you're over Zoom. Um, but just to give it is very similar. Um, but it's ever so more important to try and build up a rapport. I think that's the same with interviews or APC assessments. You trying to to get that little sense of who you are, um, show that you're enthusiastic. Um, it, for me, you know, it's really key just seeing that little sparkle in someone's eye and seeing how much you know, they really care about what they're doing. So that's probably uh, you know the brief headline stats over the APC. Um, I think it's probably best to kind of leave it up to people to put questions forward and can share knowledge as and when. Um, but Nicola, perhaps it's a good chance to pass it over. Thanks very much, Josephine. Um, I, actually, um, well, I'll come back. I'll come back to the questions when Rob's um, spoken, if that's okay. Um, so Rob uh, is going to talk to us a bit about how uh, some real estate employers support students uh, on their journey. So Rob, if I could hand over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nicola, and uh, thank you, Luke. Again, I think uh, again. Like the other um, speakers this evening, it's a great privilege to, to join you all. And uh, as a business, Europe Capital have been working with Sheffield Hallam now for nearly three years. And in a minute, I'll talk to you a little bit about the, this, the Europe Capital Scholarship that we run um, and, and the bursaries that, uh, that we're um, funding um, as, as part of um, our support to the, you know, the real estate faculty at the university. But um, I think I can safely say, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't ask Luke how old he is, but I can safely say that if, if you're all old, then I'm, I'm, I should be a grandfather. I'm, I'm 55 tomorrow. I'm, uh, I had my vaccination today. And I'm feeling okay. And I graduated uh, in 1988 um, from, a, from a university in Scotland, which is where I'm from. I, I studied economics and geography and um, maybe a bit like Mark, I, I, you know, I knew nothing about real estate at all. And some of you have heard me speak last year and actually virtually this year. And in the 33 years of my working life, I've, I've worked at uh, Jones Lang Wooten, as it used to be called now, Jones Lang LaSalle, LaSalle Investment Management. And I've been working at Europe Capital for 18 years now. So I am, um, I've always enjoyed the real estate industry. It's a very people friendly um, business. Um, it needs to work on its diversi diversification in terms of um, all sorts of you know, gender, you know, socioeconomic background, you know, race. Um, it's something I'm you know, very passionate about and um, really have, you know, it's, it's become a, a much you know, bigger part of every business, not just the real estate industry, but every business's, um, you know, I guess, values, to be honest. And... Um, we we were really concentrating. How do we get involved in 
it's the S in the ESG for, for, for an expression, which basically is you know, the social responsibility of an employer who is supporting people through their careers um, and their families, and indeed you know, succession management, which is, um, I guess where I sit now is, as a managing partner of a business of about 70 people, it's actually all about who's gonna take on my job eventually. And, 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 and as you go through your, your, your life, you will find that there are ups and downs. So uh, another word I would uh, maybe add to your list to remember is resilience. And, and I think all of us and all of you certainly studying, I think have probably had to show incredible resilience over the last 12 months. This is you know, an exceptionally odd experience for all of us, but one we'll, we'll, never, we'll never forget. And, and what we've tried to do um, in the past 12 months is, is to try and carry on as, as much as normal. So adapting to doing things remotely if we can. So there was a question about work experience. We've, we've actually run some of those programs remotely. It's, it's never gonna be as good as um, you know, the, the real thing, but you, we thought, well, we're not gonna let people down and give them nothing. So what can we do? And in a sense, um, you know, I, I kind of spread the word. I've, I've had conversations with you know, some some colleagues from other you know, private equity real estate businesses because they are interested in how how can we support students and people going through their their careers because the you know we've all been there you know I'm, I might you know, look 55 plus but actually I do remember when I was sitting and um, being interviewed for Jones Lang and um, what the head of HR as she was then called didn't realize is that was the only real estate company that I actually applied to because I didn't even know any other names. And again, I, I, I wrote a letter and, and stapled it to my CV because I'd run out of what were called standard application forms in those days. So there's always a bit of luck and chance involved in, in your life. And sometimes you grab it and, um, and sometimes you, you just try hard and, and be flexible. And, and um, if, I think if you're too... Um, so in my view, if, if you're too focused on one goal, then you can get very disappointed very quickly. And I think a, a lot of the, you know, the the more recent graduates have explained it's being prepared to be flexible and, and give yourself the chance because something else will come along. Um, it's great if you're enjoying what you're doing, um, but you know, striving after you know, the biggest salary or or something you think sounds great may not be the best thing for you. So I think I think just be open-minded. Um, now, one of the I think the reason we got involved with with Hallam and and I went around a number of universities was trying to get that engagement with with students. We we and you know, Carson said we do not take on um, your your graduates. We we take on people a bit like Will was talking about who've probably got. You know, a couple of years experience may be qualified or we take them through their the final stages of APCs. But what we do want to do is support you know, individuals who are you know, starting off their, their lives in, in real estate and want to know more. So we do quite a lot of work with school, school leavers and, and, and people in years 12 and 13 and give them an experience, a workshop, so that they have an understanding of what's happening in our world of uh, we're an investment management business. We operate across Europe. Um, so that it's not so out of reach or unfamiliar. And actually, there is a chance for them to, to, to have a go. And, and that's you know, a big proportion of women come, come on those workshops, a big proportion of the, the BAME community come on those workshops. And, and we want to encourage those people to apply to go to university and study real estate. And it's not just about becoming a chartered surveyor. It's about the built environment and, and how varied um, you know, all our careers can be, um, which I guess is, 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 should be interesting. And I think we've had some you know, you know, good results. There was a, a young lady who's one of the first um, people that we, we gave some work experience to, and she decided to apply for a, um, a university course. She was from London, so actually she went to Oxford Brooks and I think is now in her second or third year. So you know, that encouragement is, is so important. And, I'm trying to spread the word and get more, you know, more smaller real estate businesses to get involved. You know, I think people like Lambeth of Hampton, Jones Lang, they have very um, well developed um, you know, career pr progression and graduate intakes, and, and are very supportive. And quite rightly so. The you know, the the vocational training and and the courses that you you get at Hallam and Trent and, and others 
are, I think, um, incredibly strong and have been going for many, many decades. But for smaller businesses, it's, it's sometimes a challenge to pick up the graduates, but actually being able to offer work experience um, or, or to support students while they're in, you know, studying, you know, you know, you know, lack of laptops, you know, lack of food. I mean, this is not about tuition fees. This is about the you know, you know, sustenance and, and their, um, their, 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 their living allowances that we're, we're, we're talking about. It's so important and actually small amounts can go a long way. And we get, you know, we get great feedback from you know, both the, the, the development office at, at Hallam and, and, and the, the real estate team who, who provide us with that, um, you know, that, that feedback that you know, we, you know, we are making a difference. And you know, we've now got you know, two scholars going through, going through Hallam and we'll have another one next year. And we, and we want to continue that and actually start doing you know, as much as we can um, you, 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 some of you have to experience me droning on about portfolio management once a year. I know one of my colleagues um, did a lecture on on debt, and, and certainly we, we want to um, you know, give back what, what we can and actually share, which is what people in real estate like doing. They they love talking about property um, and uh, and stories about property that go back, in my case, decades, um, because actually that shared knowledge is, is what we want to pass on. So I think. Um, I'm, you know, I've really enjoyed the, you know, the working with with Hallam. We want to do more of it. Um, I want to encourage more, you know, more businesses um, to do that. You know, to help create you, know, you know, the diverse you know, workforce that I think we all you know, expect we should have, and 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 that it's not such a a barrier to to people even wanting to apply. I think I'll let I'll leave it there, Luke. Thanks, Rob. That's uh, that's really great, and yeah, we really uh, appreciate appreciate all the input that Europa Capital give at, at Hallam. You know, as do the students that obviously you support. I think I just um, one of the things that came out actually has come out really through all of uh, the the speakers, uh, and particularly in what you were saying there about um, sort of um, perhaps starting in a sort of non-standard way, and. You know, I myself have had a, a sort of range of uh, of careers that are sort of circled around real estate, but um, in different sort of disciplines. I think um, as well as the sort of um, making sure that you have that flexibility, I'd be interested in maybe you and Mark might comment on the sort of the richness that that um, different um, perspective, the different range of perspectives gives to an individual and actually how that actually adds to their value because you know they haven't perhaps just followed one groove I noticed Daniel's asked a question about you know should I just go for one thing and stick to it or you know what, what what's your views on on that is that is that for me Nicola or well that, for well, Rob sorry. and Mark I was thinking yeah, yeah. okay um yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to admit I deliberately tried to specialize in anything throughout my career, and um, somehow I've sort of succeeded. I mean, I, I, I did the you know, the graduate program at Jones Lang, so I, I did my valuation management, investment, worked in auctions, um, and then was lucky enough to work in a European investment team, um, which you know some of that was planned. Um, I, I, I did want I, not that my languages are particularly strong, but I did. Um, I'd studied geography, so I, I think the, the idea of traveling and working in different cultures and, and backgrounds and exploring different cities appealed to me. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. I lived abroad for about 18 months in, in Stockholm and Paris. Um, but again, it's that flexibility and you're giving it a go and you don't think you about, well, will I regret it if I don't do it? If you, if you think you're going to do that, then give it a go or give yourself the chance of, of, of doing it. And and I think you certainly at Europa, we have got people who've studied zoology and Arabic. And yes, yes, we have real estate um, you know, graduates as well. I, I think it's really important that um, we have you know, a, as broad a mix as possible. We have, we have accountants, we have you know, marketing people. It's, you know, the real estate industry doesn't survive just on, on chartered surveyors. And, and therefore, if you, if you want to go away and do something else and then come back, I think that's, that's great as well, to be honest. And, uh, um, I think the, you know, the story about going to work for a, effectively you know, Hermes as, a, as an operating business, again, that's hugely powerful for you. Know, yes, we know about real estate and leases and, you know, and you know, tenants and the investment values, but 
sometimes we we maybe miss the bit about what's the building being used for and how is it being used and does it really work and and therefore having that experience from a an operational perspective is is hugely valuable and M mark i presume you know you also when you're assessing candidates you know even if the role they're applying for is not exactly what they were doing before uh, you know assuming that they approach that in the right way presumably you um you know, see the value in that. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I'd, I'd totally echo what what Rob said. I mean, you know, we we I think a uh, you know a, a happily balanced um, you know early careers workforce is is a really good mixture of um, you know real estate degrees and, and non cognates. So you know, non cognates being people that uh, you know don't have a property, you know, an RICS accredited or property related degree. Because I think you know we we talk about diversity and we often think it's you know it's gender, race, religion, whatever it may be, but it's also importantly diversity of thought. And I think there's quite often um, you know what what we've we've started to see with non-cognates um, is that as Rob mentioned there you know people with zoology degrees and biology degrees and you know they every, every degree discipline brings with it a, a, a different set of skills um, every bit of work experience someone has you know often will, will bring with it a different set of skills and um, you know absolutely that that all counts and it and it you know put it all together and and you get this you know to get a truly diverse um you know workforce um you know really pays dividends and i think you know we just we just like it's a people business and and you know it's great to have people from you know that have been off and done different things and people that have had different pathways in and you know some people have done bsc some people have done msc some people have you know we've now got apprentices we've got a guy in bristol who um was training as a teacher um, and he decided he wanted to get into real estate. So um, I, I, I think a bit of advice really just for students is we see a lot of people coming in thinking, oh, I want to do investment management. So I think go in with an open mind, um, especially at the moment, because it's it's so tough. Don't just kind of pigeonhole yourself by, you know, making it clear that actually you only want to focus on one area of real estate. You know, be, be flexible and, and be open to other opportunities that you may be offered. And I think, Steph, that's sort of what you were saying as well, wasn't it, in your, you know, in terms of finding pockets where there are, you know, uh, job opportunities and things, perhaps being a bit broader minded about your approach. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Because any kind of work experience that could be related is going to give you skills, the, the soft skills around um, you know, building your credibility uh, when you then take them to something else. But actually, there's loads of opportunity with, you know, uh, private property owners, small kind of client side businesses, or actually um, councils and NHS and these kind of public sector organisations, you know, they might not be the, the kind of first um, place that you think of, but actually the range of experience you get there um, can be really brilliant and they, they, they can be just as good to get you through your APC. Um, so yeah, you know, estate agency as well, if um, ideally commercial is your you know if you really want to be in commercial but even that residential stuff will transfer over well just that um ability to adapt and and actually i think that probably when you finish as a, as a um your degree you know you don't that pressure to kind of know what you definitely need to do and is um it, it, it is kind of um you can put too much pressure on yourself for that because actually lots of people's careers are forged by you know oh well i just you know, I applied for 10 jobs and one person offered me a job. So I went there and then suddenly I'd done it for five years and I found I really loved it. And that led me on to this one. And, you know, and, and you can't yeah. always see the next five, 10 years ahead, yeah. but that's OK. Um, and yeah. just taking something is going to is going to build your opportunities. Thank you. And sorry, we've run over um, a bit, but I just wanted to end off asking Josephine about um, APC and um partly how she feels that that's likely to develop in the future and also perhaps you know how that flexibility and that sort of um perhaps slightly broader range of skills can help you when you're looking at your APC um pre preparation yeah, absolutely so there's two parts of the question the first part I'll take in terms of how it might change going forwards I think the format of the APC has been the same over many years and it, it works well and there's no uh, intentions to change that anytime soon um what might change is whether that stays virtual or whether we're back in the room and i think to be honest it's probably gonna be a blend um i don't think we're gonna snap completely back to in the room again but i think there might be some you know the flex over the next years um this next session in may will be virtual um i suspect autumn might be as well but we'll see how it evolves 
going forwards. Um, and then the breadth of experience, I think, I, I, absolutely. I, it can only be a good thing um, to have experiences, work on different things. Um, I definitely say it's you know, an advantage in different things and necessary going to one niche and being an expert in one field. Um, for the APC anyway, you've got different competencies that you need to show you've got experience in. So um, massive advocate for that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, Luke, do you, uh, shall we wrap up there? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much to all our speakers today. It's been a really um, fascinating uh, overview of the, um, the sort of market from the graduate perspective and also from the employer's perspective. And it's really great to have those sort of messages that um, have come back time and again from sort of both ends. Um, so uh, there's some really uh, useful insights, I think, for, for students uh, and those in their sort of early careers alike. Luke's uh, okay, helpfully yeah, uh, to, uh, end with putting up the slide, yeah. <laughs> yeah the ITV version of the um, presentation. Um, so uh, I heard three words coming out in almost every presentation. Um, I heard flexibility, I heard adaptability in spades. And I think that really is the watch. Those are the two watch words going forward. But I also, particularly when I was listening to um, uh, Mark's presentation, I heard something that resonated with me and I'm sure resonates with my colleagues and in a way ties into the slide that I've just put up now to advertise next week's event. The third word is the word pride. Mark may well be pr pr proud of his, um, his fledglings as they've gone off through, through, through in and into the world. And we too, as, as the people who came the stage before, the teachers, um, we're damn well proud to see our, our young youngsters getting on and out there in the world. And we're thoroughly proud with how well our, uh, our alumni have, um, have given accounts, whether newly in the workplace or in the workplace for a decade or more, you're all, you're all, you're all our babies. You're all very proud, <laughs> you know. And we watch your successes with great, with a great sense of vicarious achievement, and uh, couldn't be happier with um, the way in which you've, you've, you've contributed to, to, to tonight. And thank you also for the employer representatives who, 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 who may not be alumni. Um, you've also given us very rich insight into the workplace. So um, please, if you're able to join us next Thursday for the, um, for the uh, concluding sort of evening presentation, uh, we're looking at success and we're also going to sort of problematize or, or challenge notions of success a bit and say, well, what is success going forwards? And is it an individual endeavor or is it something a bit more collective, which connects back, I think, to the sentiment that we've heard from a number of speakers and in particular uh, what Rob was saying um, in his presentation. So thank you all. Um, thank you for indulging us as having gone over by uh, almost 15 minutes, but you know, this is rich, 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 heady stuff. And um, certainly we're gonna go away and reflect on it. And as I said at the start, uh, there'll be a recording of this event, which I will be putting out via various channels once we've finished our sequence of panel events and I'll be circulating details of that once we're in the position to, to release those out into the world. So hopefully not just today's audience, but future audiences will also bear the benefit of the um, insights we've been given tonight. So um, have a great evening. Thank you all for participating and um, see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.